for a bit of a chat ahead of the 2010 Formula One season. I've got a few friends with me. I'm not on my own because that wouldn't be a very good conversation, would it? Right, let's start. Michael Schumacher. A couple of guys that have driven with him, someone that brought him into Formula One, a man who commentated on his races for a long time. Who wants to start? Who's most excited out of all of us? Come on, Martin, you've got a nice grin on your face. Biggest story of the season by some margin. Schumacher returns after three years away. Can he still cut it against these young guys? The field is so much stronger than it was. The quality and depth is there now that he didn't have, I think, uh, during his, the main part of his career. I think he's going to find it really tough. He's really up for it, though. I mean, we were out in testing, weren't we? And he looks so relaxed. Remember, that's one of the reasons he gave up, because he got sort of weighed down by everything. Mm. I, haven't, I haven't seen him smile so much almost in three days as, as I've ever seen him before, almost like three years. Absolutely, like, reborn. So much energy, so much excitement. Taking it quite cleverly, I think, in terms of downplaying it. We're not going to win the first race. Let's see how we go. But he's, he's really up for it, you can tell. Really looking forward to it. You know him socially, DC. I know you don't talk about that much, but you see quite a bit of Michael. How do you sort of... Uh assess his psyche at the moment? Is he, is he really as up for this challenge as people think he is? Well, I think, you know, there was a lot of debate about whether he was making a mistake coming back at 41. But I think that we have to appreciate it. It's not like a boxer getting back in the ring where, you know, physically you just can't hold back the clock. You know, the large part of what happens in, in uh, motor sport is down to the, the car. And obviously the driver has to point that in the right direction. But physically there's no reason why he won't be as good as he was before. Um, he just enjoys the challenge of driving racing cars and he's finding everyday life a little bit boring. Could you physically do it, you think, if you had to now? I mean, you don't feel like you've lost much being out of the car for a year? Driving-wise, I would have no problem. You know, Martin, the generation ahead of me, and yeah. he would have no problem in terms of driving. Physically, we would both need to step yeah. up our training to be up to speed. But, I don't uh, believe it, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with it. <laughs> but, but the thing, you know, that would probably come back a little bit quicker for me than Martin because, you know, I'm just a year out of the car. Yeah. Um, but, no, you know, you just need your neck, your shoulders, things like that to be in, in top shape. I think that, you know, you've said this before, it's not that you, you lose the speed, um, you lose the need, I think, was your, your quote. And, mm, you know, Michael lost the need to, to put in all the hours when he retired three years ago. Yeah. And now he's taken time away, got a little bit bored falling off motorbikes and doing whatever else, you know, appearances and things like that. And he knows he's got a great chance to come back and have fun. I am going to steal that quote for our output this year. EJ, you've been quiet so far. Come on. I disagree. I think at 41... The perfect start to a new <laughs> Formula One <laughs> season. We're, we're I off. disagree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you cannot possibly tell me at 41 that he's in as good a condition as somebody who's at the prime... No, I know he's in good condition. Sorry, he? hang on, hang on. I enough. need to say what I say. Yeah. He said he's as fit and he's as good... At he cannot possibly... And the biggest problem is, if there's going to be an injury around, he's going to pick it up quicker at 41 because the body listen we're not superhuman he's the same as everybody else his body is 41 years on this planet and somebody else at 25 if the talent and the speed is the same where he has an advantage in the past he had the mm. speed he will always have that speed but whether he has the physical presence and content of his physique to be able to maintain the challenge, which Martin has alluded he, to, he, it'll be a much bigger challenge because yeah, there's a he, lot better he's talent more, there. He's more at risk in the rental car on the way into the circuit yeah. than he is driving the car. How old was Damon Hill when he won the title? 39? I think he was. He was oh, late, late, late Mansell. 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 And, and Michael's been a lot fitter than they ever were for decades. He'll have no problem. He's but he wants it, doesn't he? Yeah, the, one, the, the one proviso I'd say that, that I noticed in Barcelona at the test, when he was talking to a group of journalists around a table, he turned, he turned with his eyes like that. His neck is clearly still very stiff. That, and, and he mostly sort of... It was a, the shoulders and the eyes, mm. never the neck. But didn't he yeah, but I think you have to re way. remember, though, you don't, need, to be a, you don't need yeah, to be a, sort of a long neck. gymnast to, to drive the racing car. You just, you know, it's your eyes that are picking out the line. So, uh, you know, I don't disagree with Eddie that at 41 he wouldn't be as fit as he was when he was 22, but that's not the point. Grumpy racing is not about physically being the strongest and fittest person. It's about having the mind, the reactions, the decision-making capability. And, I'm, and I'm Michael Schumacher at 99% of his performance, if that's what he would be now, is still good enough to beat a number of guys out there on the, on the grid. He's not all of the guys? He's, no, not all. Not, I think he needs to deliver at 100%. All but but he's he not going to lose the race craft, is he? He's not going to lose the wisdom. He's, actually, actually, I think he could. He I will. think he I will think he lose could. that. I Why? Think, see, this is, because in race craft, you, you've, when you go to the first corner, you don't think. You just go. It's instinctive. The moment you start thinking, and, and I'm, you know, some people, when they get a little bit freaked, a little bit scared after an incident, an accident, 
um, you know, you have different responsibilities as you get older. If you start to think about that, then that's, that's it. You're never going to compete with the kids. And, and what I've said before the show is that we're getting a real life experiment here of an opportunity to see a, a legend of motorsport coming back at 41 to demonstrate whether he still has that hunger and that, that need to just instinctively go wheel to wheel with a Hamilton or Alonso or any of these other sort of young guys who so are... So do you think he may even... I mean, he's there for a three-year deal, isn't he? Do you think he may even last that then? Is there, is there, is there a question mark possibly? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I don't see how he can... He never committed to a three-year deal when he was at any other team. Why would you commit to it now? I, I think they're I think just buying pressure time. Off it, exactly. Yeah, they're just buying time so yeah. that they don't end up all the inevitable questions about August, September time. Yeah. Mm. But I completely agree with David. Uh, I think he'll be rusty with his race craft. And I can't wait to see him side oh. by side with a Ferrari. Or Lewis Hamilton. I, we actually, you know, we were down at McLaren, we put that question to Lewis Hamilton. You're alongside Michael Schumacher going into the first turn at Bahrain, who lifts first? And I don't mind telling you now, although, you know, he's going to say it on the television soon. I never lift first, was Lewis Hamilton's reaction. That is the reaction of one driver. And every single driver in that whole field is going to want to prove a point to Michael Schumacher, whether it's his teammate who thought he'd be driving with Jensen, whether it's Sebastian Vettel who wants to be the great new young German. <laughs> You've got to agree, every yeah. young driver is going to want yeah. to prove a point. I think that when they're wheel-to-wheel, -wheel, it doesn't matter if it's Schumacher or whether it, whoever, they're just trying to get the corner. And it's a very easy thing for, for Lewis to say, I never lift first. They, they have to say that. The bottom line is the clever racing drivers know that you have to slow down for the corner at some point, and you're not going to drive past your braking point to show how brave you are, because you're just going to crash. It makes a difference, though, if it's Schumacher, doesn't it? Isn't there going to be some After slight the emotional <laughs> element, Martin, when they see who it is? They don't want to be the first driver to be pushed off by Michael Schumacher on his return. Uh, to an extent, they, he might as well have a big target on his rear wing. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you in that respect. But, you know, they're, they're all there to win the title, win the races, take the points away. So I, I think if they get too hooked up on the fact, you know, psychologically, that it's Michael Schumacher, will he overtake me? Can I overtake him? then they'll lose, basically, yeah. against him. But I think the young guys see him as a wonderful opportunity to enhance sure. their own reputations. OK, let's finish off with this, then. I want to know how he's going to do in Bahrain and over the course of the season, will he be world champion? Let's start this end and work our way down. Go on. Will he be world champion? I don't think he'll be world champion. I think if the car is as Mercedes hope it is with this new floor coming, the new diffuser, it should be more on the pace. I'd, I'd say I wouldn't be surprised if I saw him on the podium. Race wins? I don't see why not. I, I, I think you'll be there. PJ? Yeah. Uh, I didn't get a proper shot at that question, so I'm going to interject <laughs> You'll get your here. chance. And I'm going to say what I need to say. If I was his father, I would have said to him, son, why? Why? Seven times world champion. He must be out of his mind. In life, you, as an individual with that sporting legacy, you have to give your sport up not the sport give you up, and he's putting himself in that position. He's becoming into a situation where he could become a sad, rejected man if he gets whipped. He won't get whipped because he's that good. Can he win a race? Yes. Title? Why should he do it? He's mad. Title, not a hope. Very nice. Martin? Never underestimate Michael Schumacher. I'd be amazed if he doesn't win races. I'd be rather surprised if he took the title. Keep it brief, I agree with Martin. One of the big stories about this year, a, a new team. It's been that kind of winter, though, Martin. If people have taken their eyes off F1 for a second, things have changed, haven't they? Yeah, but I'm really excited about the new teams. Uh, all the teams started somewhere, and it's a much better Formula One and human story following Virgin Racing trying yeah. to create a brand new team, a brand new car, a new factory, and go motor racing. It's a crazy challenge, but I, I really enjoyed I did a feature with them at the Barcelona test. I spent more time then, I was more motivated by what they're trying to do than years of seeing an underperforming Toyota team not delivering, spending $400 million a year. So I, I welcome them, and it's good to see that the grid will be diverse. All right, we're going to have to look the other way and politely ignore them for the first few races. But there, Lotus are back too. It's a great story. I'll, I'll go with it. One of the jobs that we need to do actually this year, Eddie, um, is explain to people how much of a mission it is to get a new Formula One team onto the grid, whether it's in 10 months like Virgin or five months like Lotus. Just give us some kind of idea of what will have been going on in funny little offices around the UK with people getting ready for this new season, trying to put a team together. Well, I think the first thing and the most important thing, in my view anyway, was always the financial aspect. Yeah. Some teams have different funding. In cases that I know about, and my own case was it had to be commercially viable. Uh, you had to find a sponsorship and you had to have a very strong and tough team doing that. 
Um, and, and some of the teams, that's why uh, Lotus have a good sponsor. Uh, of course, Virgin is involved. Manor or that group of people. Um, if Stefan Racing comes or whatever it is, we're not sure. <clears throat> but I think without a good financial head, and that is my one concern. I agree with Martin insofar as that it's exciting. Yeah. But all this euphoria about new teams coming to Formula One at the start of the season, I'd prefer them not to come if they're going to fail in the middle of the season because the downside and the opportunity for the begrudgers, so to speak, in terms of the certain media, this or Formula One is falling off the tracks, or this, I prefer them not to come if they don't have a realistic viewpoint of how they can see the end of the season in their sights. And if they don't have the funding for that and they don't think that they have the marketing expertise to be able to attract that kind of commercial in input, then don't go, guys. Don't waste your time and don't destroy our sport. But you never started every season knowing you got enough money to get to the end. You were in desperate trouble keeping Jordan alive, and, and you did. But I, I do agree. I think FOM, FIA, FOTA, they should all say, listen, new teams, we'll see you at the Barcelona race, race five. Yeah. Go and sort your mess out behind closed doors. Don't embarrass yourself. Two teams that might be in Bahrain have never turned the wheel until they, they get there. It's Stefan GP and Hispania, as it's now called, which is... Is, is silly, really. But, it's dangerous um, as well, but, isn't it? That's the but point. what's the alternative? The alternative is a 16-car grid mm. or the major teams all running three cars and then it'll just go... You know, then they'll run four cars and yeah. be even fewer of them and, and that then Formula One's on a slippery slope. Yeah. I, I totally disagree with saying come for the Barcelona Grand Prix. You know, these teams all put in a bid to the FIA to win the right to, to be part of the Formula One franchise. And if they have won that right, they should have the business plan in place to be there at the first Grand Prix. To, they've stopped someone else who might have been like ProDrive, for instance, I believe, were, were bidding, who Lola, might have been able to, to do a better yeah. job. So, you know, what you used to have was you had to lodge money with the FIA, and I can't remember how much it was, but it was tens of millions, and it was paid back to you during the course of the year. Why has that been taken away? Right, you know, they, they'll make an embarrassment. If they fail, they embarrass themselves, but more importantly, they embarrass the sport. And I think it's better to have 16 quality cars than 24 cars and a bunch of Mickey Mouses at the back. Well, if you're not in it, you can't win it. But I, I agree with you to an extent, except these guys put their entry in. And, and let's not get into the due diligence of the whole thing, because for sure, other teams were more viable than the ones that were chosen, some of them. I, there yeah. is no doubt about that. And you have to question that process. But when they joined up, when they signed up to come to Formula One, it was on the basis of a cost capping at 40 million. Yeah, but it was never signed. It was, never, it was a no, promise. But that's but when they set sail. They hmm. set sail with the promise of a cost cap, and then it disappeared between June and September last year. Hmm. The ground rules completely changed. Didn't yeah. it? I think it was a bunch of people who, who saw a cheap entry to the premier motorsport in the world. And if you're going at it with that, oh, God, discount, I can get into Formula One. You, you're just not serious. For these teams that have had, they've all had to start somewhere, as you say, but they've started with really solid, and, and I think what Eddie said, you know, absolutely hits the nail on the head. You, the business plan has to make sense, <laughs> otherwise, what is the point? I mean, we should praise them because they actually made it. I mean, in the teeth of a recession, to, to try and launch yourself, and as Martin said, the regulations, the rules kept on changing. So that was never going to yeah, help. But it's like it. Eddie the Eagle at the Olympics, you know, saying, oh, you've got to praise them for no, being there. No, I understand, you know, I understand this that. Is the, the fact premier, they've done it. This is the yeah. top of motorsport. This is not, no, I think they've done well. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean, no, but it's a miracle <laughs> they made it. I mean, surely there's a, maybe there's an argument of saying giving them customer cars or something, so at least they actually could make the grey, because, I mean, you talk to people at Virgin, as we yeah. did, and they, they, never, they feel that the they're other up teams like that the whole time. never got a leg up like that in the past. You know, there's enough tips. But if you're trying to extend the grid? Yeah, but you've got to have quality, not quantity. You need quality cars out there. And okay, you see the, the customer car thing, but where that falls down, everyone will want a Ferrari or a McLaren or a Red Bull. And then, the, 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 you know, your Saubers and teams like that will go out of business because they're just forced down the grid in competitiveness. But let's not forget that we've also got Cosworth turning up and supplying 10 of these cars, which, uh, thank goodness for Cosworth, because, you know, if Renault decide they're legging it out of Formula One or one, uh, one or two more manufacturers mm. go, where's the engine supply coming from? Where are the teams going to be? They had to, to stop the, you know, the flow out of the sport of teams and, and put something else in their place, even if it's not ideal at this time. Stacks of questions, lots of confusion. The, what we do know is we're going to have Virgin and Lotus on the grid for the first race, which is good news for Formula One, particularly with the return of the Lotus name. Let's once again just go along, along you all. How are these new teams going to do? How far off the pace are they going to be early doors? And what's the most they're going to hope for? 
Well, if you look at testing in, in Barcelona and, and the, the other tests that they managed to make, it, it's, a, it's a real battle. I mean, they're well off the pace. I mean, seriously off Points the pace. Points for either over the course of the season? If there's a big wet race and a big shunt somewhere, maybe. But otherwise, I think it's all about reliability, finishing the race. And the one other thing, of course, is that not only they've got to get ready for, for 2010, they've also got to think about 2011, if they possibly can. It's all about managing expectations in the first year, isn't it? Because you'll have these owners going, oh, lovely, let's get some points and make some money. Well, Branson knows clearly what's uh, required. He's been there either in the mix, certainly, with the brawn. Uh, Mike Gascoigne at Lotus certainly knows. I think Gascoigne has the better chance, even though the car seems to be hideously off the pace. I mean, that's a Formula 3 time, what they're doing at the moment. It's just completely bizarre. I'm surprised that Mike's car is that far. So it won't be that far off the pace when it comes to the race, hopefully. But he, he's got two very experienced drivers. Yeah. And for that, you have to see that there is a plan. Fernandez is there, AirAsia. It's a proper looking team, mm. and I see a good future for them. Manor, they have, I think they've got some banking back, backing and they've got some Virgin stuff, so they'll be fine. It's the others I'm slightly more concerned about. Um, although, if of, of the four or five teams to come, and I don't know whether we're including Sauber as a new team or not, I am, because it was the demise of BMW. If you called Braun a new team, you have to call Sauber a yeah. new team, or that's the way I see it. Mm. So let's put those. Who's going to be the best of the new teams? Possibly Sau Sauber. OK. I don't think he's left much for you two to say. Well, I think we're talking about teams new to Formula One this year or returning after a long period away. Um, if there are four who make it to, the, to Bahrain, I'd be amazed if two of them are still there at the end yeah. of the season. Do you see? Well, the FIA have taken the strange decision to change the point scoring. And uh, which I, I think, you know, you lose all the historical data. It's a bit you like, mean you lose being the highest British I points do score. definitely lose that <laughs> at some point down the line. But, um, the, the, you know, it's a bit like having a lead medal at the Olympics, you know, yeah. because they make it nice for those who've turned up. But you get, uh, you know, top 10 points. So if these new teams can't finish at least 10th at some point during the year and score a point, just coming back mm. to your question to Jonathan, then, you know, they're, they're really in big trouble. It seems like the whole world are excited about this season. Um, what we haven't got, though, are the big regulation changes that we had at the start of the 2009 season, but still enough to confuse Eddie. He was just sitting there going to Martin, now, what are the rule changes? What are we... Come on, Eddie, let's, <laughs> see, let's uh, see how up you are with Formula 1. What are the big changes for 2010? It shows you how easy it is for me to confuse you. Um, <laughs> Come on, Because I'm we an go. expert at that. Uh, the big and the big talking point, of course, is the fuel and uh, the weight of the car. Um, it will have a huge significance. If only we're talking about drivers coming back, Schumacher. If you could have one driver back and put him in your car, you would want the old prof, you, you, you'd want Prost. Uh, he wasn't called the professor for, for no reason. He was absolutely perfect. Slow, neat, calm, and that's what is going to be a completely different driving style. Mm. And um, I think this might have some good effect for Schumacher because he's cool and he's calm with the car. So the fuel is the biggest thing, and I think the rest of those rule changes pale into insignificance because this is the key one. So you want him back, then, do you? Prost. Is it? No, 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 you're talking about Michael Schumacher. He's the man who knows what he's doing. No, he has decided to come back. I didn't ask him to come back. In fact, <laughs> well, you'd if, want I was, him, if I was his manager, I would have told him he needs a bullet in the head to do that. He's mad. Right, he's let's, mad. Let's, let's be sure about that. Let's, he's stick mad. let's stick to what we're talking about. Let's stick to what we're talking about, which is rule changes. So you're talking about the changes to fuel, which is essentially no refueling. David, give us an insight into how this will change for the drivers, because people I will be thinking, so the only difference is you don't stop and put fuel in the car halfway through. What is the big change with having no refueling during the race? Well, you've got to carry that mass right from the, the, the lights going out, and obviously that's going to reduce as the race goes ahead. But that first set of tyres that you use are carrying a lot more weight. So it's the same compound that, uh, that you could potentially use at the end of the race, but it's being worked a lot harder. The energy that's going into them and the brakes, and uh, the driver has to manage that. So what I'm curious to see is just how hard the drivers can actually push in those first 20 laps or in that first set of tyres. Obviously, as the fuel comes off, they'll naturally start going quicker anyway and then they can start exploiting other areas of the car's performance. The car that qualifies will have no fuel, just enough fumes to get it back to the pits after its fast run. The car that starts the race will be five seconds per lap slower yeah. because they'll add 25% weight to the car. It'll be uh, much heavier, as David said. So they'll have to uh, make sure the ride height's uh, good so it doesn't hit the ground too much. We've got a new front tyre for 2010 that's 25 millimetres or one inch narrower which they've got to manage as well and what difference will that have and that means they've got less front grip basically last year they felt that the front tire was too good and it was hurt it was making the back end of the car step out and slide around too much 
You've got other aspects of that. Uh, brakes are a big issue at certain circuits. Bahrain, the first Grand Prix, would be one of them. Montreal would be another, for example, where there's really heavy braking. So they've got to manage the brakes with this new higher fuel load. 165 kilograms, 220, 230 litres. The first time we've had this situation since 1993, when refueling was last banned. And that means the cars are longer to get the fuel in. So they're going to have to really manage the car through the Grand Prix as we used to do in the 80s and early 90s. Yeah, oh, yeah a few other little changes like hubcaps and things are, are, are being banned, but they're quite small. In terms of the big stuff that people at home are going to are going to really notice is is the whole refueling thing, and particularly in qualifying. Yep. Real, true qualifying. Who's on pole deserves to be there. Are you looking forward to commentating? Oh on yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah, I'm, it's, it's what we've talked about you know, already um, in terms of you know it, it's sprint finishes now. Q1, Q2, and Q3. And don't forget also the top 10 qualifiers have got to start the race on the, the tyres in which they, they set their grid time. But also it's the strategy which changes as well because the, you know, it's not a fuel-adjusted grid anymore. We now know it's fastest, but as Martin mm. and David have said, what is the, how is the car going to perform with a huge load of fuel? I'm talking to, to all the drivers, Master in particular, he was saying you've got to watch out you know, for those first laps, how the car is going to perform because it's, and it's, it's about getting the setup right, the balance right, because it's going to change all the time throughout the race. And the other thing, of course, is pitch stops. Whereas before, the, the, the men on the, uh, with the tyre guns and so on, they could, they could change the tyres in four seconds, but they still had another three, four seconds while the fuel was going in. Now, it's got to be absolutely on the nail. And everyone's talking about getting under three seconds. It, in a race, it's not that easy. They've all been practising so much throughout the winter. Get it right. Ledge, if I may interject here, I, I'd like a question. If I play Jay Humphreys for a second, Far I'd like to ask DC a question. Big shoes to fill. In your dreams. If you got my name right, I would love it. We've worked together for only a year. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's <laughs> trivial. Can you listen to the series? All right, question? Jordans, carry on. Um, I can't believe that a car who qualifies 10th has to start the race on the tyres that he qualified, and a car that's 11th can start on brand new tyres. It makes a nonsense. I just don't get it. I'm sorry, it just doesn't make sense. It's just not fair. Mm. And it doesn't, I think it's a rule change that was unnecessary. You either have racing all the way through or not. What's your view? Well, I agree with you. I, I think it's, uh, it's there to try and generate a difference between the, what will inevitably, after a few races, be a fairly static top ten. You might occasionally get, if people are, are getting balked and qualifying or they have problems, you might have the, the, the back few of the top ten swapping places with those just outside. But I think largely, week in, week out, the top six cars tend to sort of swap positions and be quite solid in, in the top ten. Qualifying, so I think it's there just to try and generate and mix and create a bit of racing. So you, you're right. In sporting terms, it's not fair. It's a bit like saying that, you know, and I don't know. I can't even think of an example. But giving a giving a small team, giving a small team an advantage in some way to try and put them up there with the big teams yeah. who've earned the right to to be at the front. What about the strategy though? Because you always love doing things off the hoof, spontaneous. Let's do this. A quick call. That's going to change as well, isn't it? Because people aren't now going to know everything. You know, you can't no, plot absolutely no, no, you Absolutely not, because if you come up against traffic, you can more comfortably yeah. make the call to bring the car, car in. Whereas if you, I mean. if you brought the car in in the past while well, you still had the fuel on board, yeah. you'd carry dead fuel yeah. up until your pit stop. Yeah. So you'd penalise yeah, yourself. So I think it's going to turn completely over. It's yeah. going to, instead of it being uh, uh, proactive in terms of, let's see how far we can get into a stint with this tank of fuel. You just went, as long as you went further than who was around you, you'd overtake mm. them. Now, they're all going to be watching each other, and as soon as one comes in the pits, you're going to see a flood of cars coming in the pits to react to that. So I think it's going to be a less defined strategy mm, than we've seen before. But if the tyres hang on, I think we might only see one pit stop per mm. race. People will worry if you're qualifying on zero fuel, the fastest car will start at the front, therefore will there be any overtaken? How will it affect the racing? You're the man that calls it with Jonathan. What do you think? I wasn't listening to that question, <laughs> sorry. Shall I ask question for you? Was. Yeah, go on, They, they shouldn't worry. No. They shouldn't worry. They should worry about things, other things, more important, mm -hmm. like, you know, have they paid their tax bill and, Fine. you know, have they remembered... Isn't that why they introduced the... the, the You're feeling random... guilty or something? No, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't pay tax. He has no tax bill to pay, does he? <laughs> um, and also, double diffusers, they remain for this year. They're banned from 2011. The teams have taken them to the limit. How much of an effect is that going to have on cars with narrow front tyres? I mean, are we going to see the cars following each other closely and having a pop at each other? I th apparently, they've got more downforce than ever before, these cars. So I don't see them following each other any better. I think they're going to struggle a bit more. Only if the tyres really mm. degrade 
uh, a large amount are we going to see a lot of overtaking I think the really stupid thing for Formula 1 is they're all trying to save money so double diffusers are, are acceptable which means redesigning the back of the car having a higher narrower gearbox and all sorts of things so they've all homed in on what Braun found last yeah. winter fantastic so what do they do they ban it for 2011 so next year they're going to have to make a new yeah. car with a low gearbox and a wide gearbox and they're going to spend it's Tens madness, but it's fun minutes. madness, and we all enjoy working on it, and I hope that you enjoy watching it. What a Formula 1 season we're going to have this year. Fernando Alonso in a Ferrari, Michael Schumacher's coming back. The Lotus name is in Formula 1 once again. But it's two British drivers in a British team that everybody's talking about. And for the first time, the two most recent world champions of the same nationality racing together. How's it going to go, David? Well, inevitably, one of them is going to be somewhat disappointed come the end of the season. But I think that... Uh, Lewis, having been well established at McLaren, obviously won his world championship there, you have to expect him in the early part of the season to have the upper hand. You know, everything about that car is, is logged away in his cerebellum and you know, uh, for, for Jensen he's going to have to take some time in racing to, to really discover that McLaren car. So I would expect to see his strengths come through at the second half of the season. How hard is it to step into a team? where someone like Lewis has been there since he was 14 and it is built around him. Genuinely, how difficult could that be for Jensen? McLaren is a very friendly, helpful team, yeah. despite their reputation sometimes. And you, you can engage with them. They're, they're a good, good group of people. They're professional. They're used to winning world titles. And I think they'll embrace Jensen. But he's had to leave his engineer behind, working mm. with Michael Schumacher at Mercedes-Benz. But Lewis has got a new engineer as well. And Lewis has... Um, stop working with his dad and there's, there are a number of changes going on in Lewis's life as well as Jensen so I think that equals it up a little bit but you're still entering Lewis's territory his own backyard I think Jensen will find it quite tough there'll only be one winner and one loser out of that fight and I think it'll be a lot closer than people expect people are ready to dismiss Jensen and uh, he's not world champion for no good reason um, but I, I think Lewis will just edge that battle I went down to the McLaren Technology Centre a few days ago and what was amazing was that Lewis was the guy who was quite quiet and he was on his phone quite a bit. I, you know, he had a few things on his mind, but Jensen looked so chilled out in his new environment. He knew the names of the guys in the team. We wandered around. And I think he's feeding off the fact that everyone at the Technology Centre loves the fact they've got the two British world champions in their team. And it, the whole thing could just snowball, couldn't it? Yeah, but he's very good at that, though, isn't he? Actually, Jensen. sorry to, to come in yeah. on that, but I think what might be happening there is because Lewis has been there for so long yeah. since he was a young kid in karting, maybe he's just taken it a little bit for granted. You know, and there's a lot of changes going on. And one of the things we missed out, of course, is he's no longer with uh, Nicole, his girlfriend, who was with him. Oh, I think they're back together now. Oh, yeah, they are, actually. OK. Well, but by the time the season starts, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> all right, we see. I'm, I'm a bit behind in the gossip things. <laughs> but a number of changes, you know, his father obviously stepping down. Um, you know, he probably is a bit distracted. Yeah. And for, Jen, for Jensen, he's fully focusing on this new challenge. And he's a world champion, so he's still buzzing on that. He's, he absolutely is buzzing on that. I mean, mm. he, and we remember at the launch, he looked really, really calm. He's, he's done lots of... Uh, events, lots of big occasions, and, and he almost seems to thrive on that. Uh, and it's been such a long time in coming as well. Ten years in Formula One, seem to take the wrong decisions so often, the wrong turnings, never in the right car at the right time, and then achieved. Now he's gone to this, this, this really big challenge. And in a way, you can see why he's done it. And I, and I, I, I tend to agree with Martin that, and David, how, how is he going to settle in? Because the one thing which came out of last year was how he needed to feel that everything was just so. He mm. does like things 100%. And when it's not... He doesn't find it so easy to work round, whereas maybe Lewis does. It's his car, as you say. And whether Jensen can... It, I think the key to Jensen really making a go of it and being successful is settling in as quickly as possible and feeling as comfortable as possible within the team and the car. EJ, okay. you're looking, Guys, EJ's looking you, very pensive. You, you, you lads are talking something <laughs> up that clearly is not there. I mean, the facts are not there to support what you're saying. It's a nonsense. Lewis has it all under control and... I think it's a mistake that Jensen went there because in this environment it is going to be at least mid-season before Jensen can come at the same speed or level if in fact he yeah. can. We all adore Jensen, we all want him to do well, but let's not be unrealistic. This is Lewis's season and he will relish this opportunity of absolutely crunching the current world champion. That's my opinion. Very few people have won back-to-back -back world championships. Mm. It seems hard to maintain that level of commitment. Um, and I, I think the car will be good. I think it really depends on how it manages its tyres, if you need a smooth driving style to yeah. manage those tyres and brakes. As we saw Jensen doing Monaco last year, the only man who could make the soft mm. tyre work then, he just 
walk the whole weekend. I think it'll come towards him. If it's about manhandling the car through different phases of the race as the fuel burns off, I think Lewis will thrash him. Technically, the car might be great, and we can talk about that in, in detail, but psychologically, Jensen showed last year how important that is in doing well in Formula One. You scale the mountain, you win the world title, and everyone says, oh, it's hard to motivate yourself from then on. Surely going to McLaren is the perfect thing to do, because you give yourself a whole new set of motivational tools, you, you set yourself a whole new load of agendas, and life is not easy, you're not in the comfy chair. It's, isn't that the right decision to make? No, I don't agree with that, no? because you, you build a team around you, and they start designing a car that inevitably the car just starts to mould towards your requirements, your driving style, people understand what you want, they interpret and translate what you're saying from inside the cockpit. Mm. That builds, you've seen it with Massa at Ferrari, would be a good example with so many drivers, and Jensen's walked away from that into a completely new environment where he's got to start again. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, he was many years at Honda before it became Braun, yeah. and things like where radio switches are, where the diff adjuster, you know, the quick uh, shift for the brake balance, he's had to adapt to all that. And it's not quite as simple as saying, okay, it's on the left rather than the right. Mm. When you're driving into a wall of spray at 200 miles an hour, you don't need to be looking down to see where, the, where that particular knob or switch is. It has to be instinctive. And that will be the area where Lewis has the comfort zone in the beginning of the season. After being at McLaren so long, how long did it take you to get used to the way the Red Bull operates and where things are on the steering wheel there? Well, I just had everything adopted. Exactly I, actually as it took, was. I took right. the steering wheel from McLaren to Jaguar stroke Red Bull as it yeah. was, you know, the dashboard, all of those things, which McLaren were very happy to sell to, to Red Bull, and I just mm. didn't see the point of trying to develop our own technology when you could buy great stuff that I'd already used and developed over nine years. What about the relationship between the two? How's that going to shape up over the season, EJ, particularly if one of them keeps on winning, even if it is by a hundredth of a second? That would be my least worry. I think they're two really, really cool guys. I think they will make it possible for them to, that's my view, I think they will enjoy each other's company. Just like to just momentarily go back on what we were talking about. We all talk about it was Jensen's decision to go there and I know I'll probably incur the wrath of Mercedes again. I believe Braun didn't make enough effort to keep him. They should have kept him and he should have stayed at Braun. Right. It didn't happen, so he went to McLaren. Mm. So don't just necessarily all agree that it was his wish to go to McLaren. I think that was the second motivation. Okay. Well, Lewis says the car is good. McLaren seem happy with it. Jensen seems happy at the team. Lewis or Jensen, and why? Who's going to win out of those two? Year one together, I have to believe that Lewis will have the advantage. But I think you have to look at Jensen's career at McLaren. And at the moment, I think it's a three-year con contract. Mm. So let's come back and have this conversation at the end. Let's do it. Martin? 2010, Lewis will, will be Jensen. Easily? No. Okay. No, it'll never be easy. Totally agree. But it'll be Lewis? It'll be Lewis. Jonathan, are you the man to give Jensen Button the winning nod? I wish I could. Yeah. But I can't. Lewis Hamilton, I think. Two years with really dramatic fights for the World Championship. How's it going to go this year, David? Is it going to be another vintage year, do you think? I think potentially it's the best season. Um, that we're going into for, for more than a decade. You know, if I think back to the time when we had so many winning drivers in top teams, mm. uh, then I think you have to go back to the sort of late 80s when you're sort of Prost, Mansell, PK, Senna's, and, and you know, it's a period that Mansell, uh, that, uh, Mansell, that Martin, <laughs> Martin oh, knows very really well. You'll take that, won't you? <laughs> oh, no, I just... And, uh, <laughs> God, you've lost weight. <laughs> Where's your you moustache? Your eyebrows. <laughs> Where's your moustache? It's not, his eyebrows are much smaller in real life, aren't they? Um, anyway, I, I think potentially it, it is a, a classic season that we're going into. Um, you know, someone at the end of the day in one of those top four teams is going to finish eighth in the championship, which for a winning driver is a disaster season. We say that, though. They could finish lower than that. There could be a surprise. You don't know. This time last year, if we'd have sat here, probably before the Braun went out for its first run, we would never have given them a hope in whatever's chance of doing, doing the business. Who do you think could surprise us this year, Martin? Jensen Button says there are seven teams that have got fast cars, and I think he's, ab he's absolutely right, maybe even more, because uh, Sauber have been quick in pre-season testing, Force India, Toro Rosso, the Williams looks handy with the new Cosworth engine, um, but we know that over a season they haven't got the resource and the infrastructure to keep developing that car as Ferrari, McLaren, Mercedes-Benz and Red Bull will mm. be evolving the car through the season. So we know that those four teams are going to produce the world champion driver and the world champion team. Sauber, I think, will surprise. They look like they've got a great car and they, they, 
got a lot of history of running a reliable, solid motor car. Force India, the two drivers there are very excited about their new car. They're really positive. Um, Sutil's got to stop crashing into things. Uh, he's got potential. And you know, I, I think they, they could score some serious points on occasions. But uh, as the season evolves and as they all get used to the new strategies and running full tanks of fuel for the first time since 1993, I think it will normalise, as David has said. Mm. And it is about the development race once again this year, isn't it, Eddie? And particularly for some of those teams, having the resources to be able to keep tabs on, on the big teams. Resources, resources, resources. Yeah. It's the key aspect. If you can balance your income uh, and your funding correctly and you're able to put in place uh, up the upgrades and updates, you will have a good car. There are seven teams, and I'm glad to see that Sauber, Peter Sauber is a magic guy, mm. and he's back, and he will make a very good car. Force India are a big surprise. Mark Smith has built a fabulous car there. But the top four, just like football, will be the top four. Okay. We can't get away from that. That's well, a fact. Let's focus on the top four, then. Let's just go through and discuss them. Uh, Adrian Newey designed a fantastic car last year. Most people have copied it for this year, and he's sort of stepped up once again and brought out the new Red Bull. Um, how do you see it going there, Jonathan? What are going to be the big reasons for Red Bull to possibly win the title this year? Well, they finished last year with a real storm, didn't they? Won the last three races and had the fastest car on the grid. Question is, can they build on that momentum when you've got Ferrari having scrapped everything in the middle of last year, almost done a brawn? Right, forget 2009, we're aiming for 2010, mm. so that's going to be interesting. In terms of the driver partnership, they're the only one of the top four teams, as we expect them to be, McLaren, Ferrari, Red Bull and Mercedes to have kept the same two drivers. So there's continuity there. Mm. Powerful lineup as well. They know what's what. Um, picking up on what we were talking about with Jensen Button and Lewis Hamilton, people sort of getting to know each other, getting into the team, getting to know there. I think the one concern there, well, two concerns. Maybe there's reliability. With better reliability last mm. year, Red Bull could have pushed Braun a lot closer. And also just, as I understand at the moment, quick over a short run, but it's the long runs. What about the, the, the tyre wear? How well is the car going to do there? You think back to, say, Sebastian Vettel in Monaco. So that would be a concern, but certainly quick and certainly in the thick of it. I suppose Adrian Newey would point us back to 91, 92. In 91, it was a fast car that he designed that was a little fragile. In 92, they went out and won the title. You've got some quite useful ins at Red Bull for us, David. I'm sure you'll mention that name more than once over the course of the season. Never. How are they feeling inside the team? Are they confident? Do they think this could be the year? They've said they need to win the title. Yeah, they're as well prepared for the season as any other. It's still a relatively young team in terms of the, the investment and development that's gone on. But the thing that let them down last year in terms of reliability was the engine, not the car. Mm -hmm. And what let them down at the beginning of the season was the interpretation of the double diffuser, which only a few teams actually started the year with. OK, let's talk about Mercedes Grand Prix. Um, a concern for them that over the course of last year, as it was then, the Braun GP car didn't develop at the rate that it should have done? Or is that a case of holding back your resources and putting them on this year's car, do you think, Martin? They had a head start, didn't they, with this... Uh, I can't wait till we lose the word double diffuser out of right. our lives, like credit crunch One year. and One other year. silly <laughs> millennium bug or something. Yeah. Um, you should be on grumpy old men rather than <laughs> <laughs> Formula One break. No, did you say grumpy old man? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking about myself here, Martin. <laughs> Uh, you hadn't finished what you were saying. It? <laughs> He's thrown him again. <laughs> right, where are we? Um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be tough for Mercedes. A lot of pressure on them. Yeah. Um, they've cut loose from McLaren. There's a rivalry if you ever needed mm. one. Three German drivers at Mercedes-Benz. And, and they're out on their own now. And three Brits at, uh, with their test drivers at McLaren. And I'm really looking forward to that head-to-head. -head. Um, Ross Braun and Michael Schumacher. Will the old magic be there again? I think it will. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't underestimate those two getting their act together. It's horrible indeed, or something yeah. when they come back. But you do sense that they're, they're not quite there with their car in winter testing, although mm. they're just as likely to pull something out of the hat yeah. for, the, for the first race. Never so, underestimate Ross Brown, I suppose. And, or Nico Rosberg. I'm a big fan of Nico mm. Rosberg's as well. So I think Mercedes will be there or thereabouts. OK, well, McLaren retain their history. What they don't retain is ties as close to Mercedes as they had before, but they've come out with two world champions and a very aggressive-looking car for this year. How do you see the MP425 performing for them? Well, one thing, just, just at, a, at a basic level, they've done very well. In, in terms of Mercedes coming back, talking about the silver arrows, which looks more like a silver car to you than McLaren. Mm. Very clever. So they, they've, they've got that in terms of the, the, the look. Um, and as Martin was saying, there's a, there's a great rivalry there, isn't there, between McLaren and Mercedes now. Um, mm. And there's a slightly fractious relationship by the end. It's, it, there's, there's a real battle there. Are we going to bill it as the, uh, the Anglo-German war? 
you know, here we go. You know, sure. Mercedes with uh, all the three Germans. It was meant to be an international team, I thought, at one stage. Not anymore. That's what, that's what no. I was saying. It's got to be an international team, and they've got three drivers. In terms of um, uh, McLaren, I mean, it looks, it looks a smart car. And they, the, the way they improved and developed last year, having started, you know, two, two and a half seconds off the pace, and then by the end, winning races on the pole, <laughs> They're, 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 looking, they're looking sharp, okay. and um, certainly in, uh, in testing the la last day, they, um, they, were, they were up there with Ferrari. And finally, talking about Ferrari, they've got the drivers they want. They didn't have the season they wanted last year. There's big pressure on the Italians to deliver, David. Yeah, but they're well used to that. You know, the whole nation gets behind Ferrari, and uh, when they have painful seasons, then the whole country's down. But I think they've shown good pace in testing. In Alonso, they have a real star driver that can, yeah. can pull that team together in a way that, even with his great driving talent, Kimi Raikkonen wasn't capable of, of delivering. Hmm. How do you feel about Ferrari's chances this year, Matt? I think Alonso starts the season as the favourite, closely followed by Hamilton in the McLaren. Certainly in my book, we're guessing really, aren't we? Let's be honest, I hate all these clever predictions. But that's where if you my get it right, though, all you sound clear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't that, you? But that's where my money would go on. I think Alonso is massively motivated to yeah. put the misery of his McLaren season in 07 behind him, two very lacklustre years at Renault, all the Crashgate scandal that he didn't really quite get touched by, but um, he wants to come up and deliver, and I think he'll be such a force of energy for the Ferrari team, who appear to have a mm. pretty good car mm. as well. And, uh, you know, it's a question whether Massa can improve his game yet again and hang on to Alonso shirt tails. It's not easy, is it, for Massa? You know, Kimi Raikkonen comes into the team, he manages to beat him, he then has the nasty accident in Hungary, and then it's like, thanks for that, there's another world champion for you to try and beat. You know, it's always stepping up to the plate for Felipe, isn't it, Eddie? It is, but um, Felipe has done really well, and uh, he's surprised a huge number of people, me included. Um, Nevertheless, I have a concern about Ferrari, which I actually believe they'll win the Constructors' Championship, or that's what I would think they will do. And that, be so, uh, despite mm. Todd not being there, Ross Braun not being there, and probably the most important, Rory Byrne not being there, for me, was the real brainchild in that team. So they're still going through a growing period in time, and there's no real evidence for me to see that they have still the same management and technical structure that they had before. That would be my, my only question mark mm. for Massa and for Alonso. Alonso is going to be hugely quick. Don't, I don't see him win the championship. At least they can't screw the refueling up, can they, at Ferrari anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't like it about that. Which all the time. You yeah, know? they're still you, old, uh, used to carry the extra weight of the nozzle hanging out the end yeah. of it all the time. Yeah. Watch what they do with a wheel gun next, I suppose. Um, I want a one-word answer very quickly. The Constructors' World Champion, Jonathan. I've gone for McLaren. Ferrari. McLaren. Red Bull. Oh, oh, didn't we know that was going to happen? Oh, didn't we know that was going to happen? What the hell's that? I don't, I don't laugh when you give no, your answer. Don't worry, the check is in the pocket. Yeah, that's oh, another yeah. 20 quid in your back pocket. <laughs> Let's talk about the drivers as well. Uh, David, uh, Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber, done. Uh, Martin, <laughs> who do you reckon could win the uh, Drivers' World Championship? Fernando Alonso. OK. Hamilton. Hamilton. OK, and you don't get an answer after your last one. Oh, go on, come on. Sebastian Vettel. Oh, oh, surprise, yeah. surprise! Look at that. Right, there you go. Those are the thoughts of our experts ahead of the Formula One season. 13th and 14th of March will be live from Bahrain for all the build-up and live coverage of both qualifying and the race. It's going to be some season, and we'll all see you then.